this model is completely different from anything that you have seen previously. In fact, when it comes to certain categories, it's performing above a PhD level. And here's a teaser. They hope to have models that can think for hours, days, even weeks. Good morning, Chris. Hey, Richard. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I've got uh, the remnants of COVID still in my body, so I'm kind of struggling through that. But um, yeah, uh, it was a good week. How was your week? It was a great week. I'm sorry to hear um, that you're still dealing with that. It, it always sucks, but hopefully it's something that you'll um, get over over the next couple of days. Well, yeah, I hope so, because I'm going to be traveling. So, <laughs> where, where are you headed? Uh, I am headed out to uh, Utah. I'm going to be spending a, a couple of days with uh, some close friends out there. We're doing a little mini road trip, and then I will be going over to Colorado to do some work-related stuff. Uh, I'll be in, in Boulder. So, yeah, a couple of, couple of weeks on the road, um, fun times, actually spending some time with people that I really like. So, as that, as you know, that's my uh, my entire mission in life is to uh, book the maximum amount of trips with people that I love. That's essentially my North Star <laughs> trick. I love that. It's, it's simple enough, and it's something that we can consistently work towards. Um, my week was great. All, all the best things. <laughs> It does, right? Like, what more is there to strive for in life than to squeeze as much joy as you can out of it? The week was great. Um, so many different news that brought this week from Apple with their um, new iPhones and uh, the new um, smart devices that they're bringing to market with Apple Intelligence. We had new models. We had a, a breakthrough model from OpenAI that have been deep diving in over the last few days and it is amazing so, so many thoughts on that i'm actually preparing a dedicated video just on openai's new model and of course new releases new product updates um, some from adobe uh, but overall a fantastic week if you are an ai enthusiast if you're a developer if you're in a business you're going to be getting access to better technology, better tools, and that's what we're all about. Yeah. So why don't we start with Apple and Adobe? I, I think there's two completely different stories here, but uh, one, the, the one from Adobe feels to me like the this company is taking a very measured approach to AI uh, in contrast to, say, what Figma did, which was come out of the gate pretty strong with AI tools and then have to roll them back because of some concerns about copywriting and IP use. Uh, Adobe have come out very strongly in favor of training the models on creative work that doesn't come from users or doesn't come from their audience. In fact, it actually is very appropriately stuff that they are building and using to train the models. So let's talk a little bit about that because that's um, the, the the overlap here between them and 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 uh, Apple is that they're both slow rolling their approach to AI. So here's what I'll say: I I think it's important if you are a listener to recognize that as we accelerate towards an AI first world, what we're seeing is a very important trend. The best technology, the best model isn't necessarily going to be the model that wins. Um, a model is not a product. A technology is not a product. And we talk about that a lot um, on previous podcasts. But I think Adobe epitomizes this trend, right? When you look at what they're offering now, with their Firefly video model. It's not necessarily the best video model that we're seeing. However, the integration into professional workflows, which seems to be something that Adobe is keen in on, is really fantastic. And let's take a step back and look at what they did with text-to-image. When you look at how they approached their text-to-image model with Firefly, it wasn't, oh, we're just going to create the best consumer text-to-image model. Uh, they said, we're going to build it into Photoshop. We're going to build it into Adobe Express. Uh, these are tools that our users are already deeply integrated with. Um, they understand the workflows. And so now when you go into Photoshop and you expand your canvas and you just automatically have AI fill in the blanks, it doesn't feel like you're using AI. And without thinking, people are already starting to utilize these tools to gain a little bit of efficiency here, a little bit of efficiency there. And I think that's a big uh, differentiator for Adobe, having an ecosystem that exists where their users can just tap into the technology versus to, to learn a new tool. Now, one thing that was interesting there is that we saw that unlike 
their previous attempts to just really focus on professional workflows, they started creating web, web tools where you could use a lot of these technologies just on the web um, in the more consumer friendly applications. However, with the new models this week, with their video models, it seems they're really intent on professional workflows. Um, these are tools that they're bringing to Premiere Pro, where for example, let's say you have a, a clip and you need to fill in a little bit more footage, you'll be able to just right click and it will generate footage based on the existing clips, based on the audio, and that's pretty fascinating, right? Uh, and it's, it's a different approach versus a blank canvas where it's just text to video. This is taking the context of what you're doing and um, where you're working and then using AI to fill in the blanks. So I, I love their strategy. I think it's brilliant. I think they're going to see a lot of adoption uh, because of it. Yeah, I actually had a personal connection to this story. Um, my sister and my mother are uh, working on a children's book. My sister is writing the book and my mother is illustrating the book and the illustrations are those kinds of things that fit into this environment. In other words, here is somebody who is not necessarily the most professional user of these products, but absolutely a user that needs to, um, say, take an illustration and expand it to fit the space that the book publisher has given them. So they get the dimensions, they have to take these illustrations and they say, oh, the sky has to be larger or the background has to be and so using the intent behind these models, they're able to take that story um, and un essentially give it a, a prompt to be able to say, this is where we'd like to go with this, this image. So very, very practical, incredibly useful for illustrators. We'll start to see, as you said, how other professional users of these Adobe products start to use it. So, But I like their slow roll approach, um, not because, well, it, it kind of, um, the impa the impatient part of me doesn't like it, <laughs> but the business part of me loves it. I think this is a very measured approach. The email that came out from their head of product um, was very, very thoughtful. You know, this is how we're doing it. This is how we're approaching it. This is how we approach the privacy and IP issues. Very, very thoughtful and in complete stark contrast to what Figma did, which was to essentially unveil AI at their big conference config earlier this year, only to met, be met with a lot of designers saying, hang on a second, didn't you just steal my design to create that? I, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Richard. And there's one other piece to this that I'm going to call it from a strategic standpoint. So of course, Adobe understands their audience, their market. They understand that they're going to need to have the copyright protections built in. And these are professionals that don't want to have issues when they're either um, putting on their own content or servicing clients to say, hey, um, you stole work here, you have um, copyright or IP infringement um, here. And so they have been very thoughtful with that, but they've also been smart. So with the video model, for example, they have said, you know what? We're also going to give our users choice we don't need to offer the best model on the market. If you want to go and use a Sora, if you want to go and use a Pico, we will have those as third-party integrations in our tools so you can choose to do that also. And I think that is brilliant because they are now looking to establish themselves as a platform with more stickiness than to say, we are going to lose the users that are going to prefer these other models. They're saying, hey, it doesn't matter which model you, you're looking for, we're going to offer a way in which you can access it on our tools. There's another point here. This has also been a strategy that Adobe has used to actually figure out what acquisitions to make. So they've had relationships. I think Macromedia is probably the obvious one back, back in the day. Yeah, Flash. You know, they'll have their users essentially um, borrow that technology into their platform. And when they see a reason to double down on that, they'll say, look, we've got a, we've got the usage data here. Now we can actually go and make that acquisition. And I think that's probably what they're doing here. Instead of starting from scratch or convincing somebody that their model is better than the other models, they're saying, well, come use the other models and, and then we'll look at that data. And maybe a licensing deal or an acquisition is in the pipeline because of the, the increase um, say maybe a Sora over a Pico or something like that. Exactly. And then kind of switching gears, I, I want to transition to what Apple did this week because Apple had their big 
September event. It was the announcement of the new iPhones. Everything that they announced, we already anticipated. Most of them were um, known in leaks. Uh, we had uh, the new version of iOS 18 already out to um, developers and beta testers for the last couple months. And so there was nothing here that was a massive surprise. Uh, I think for many, they were expecting a lot more maybe on the AI front. And here's what I will say, and I, I spoke about this before, I think Apple is behind when it comes to AI. And uh, that was more evident than ever at this event. Um, so a couple of things I'll call it. One, the devices are incremental upgrades. If you have uh, maybe an iPhone 15, I don't know if a lot of the features are going to be so compelling where you think, man, I have to upgrade to this, to this new model. Um, but, but you're also seeing the transition of a mature company, a company that is um, that has matured with hardware to move to software and to double down on services. And so you're now seeing the beginning of a new Apple, an Apple that the hardware won't necessarily matter because despite what happened at this event, they are going to release so many upgrades from a software standpoint over the coming months that it will make the hardware still valuable. And I think that trend is going to continue with AI where a lot more value is going to be derived and buried on the software side versus the hardware, which you'll probably find um, the same with most of the different providers. And so that's where Apple has some very interesting and strategic decisions that they'll need to make. So what do we know so far? Well, in terms of the AI features, not many of them are actually shipping on the new phones that you'll get later this week. In fact, I would say some features will come next month and the majority of features will come next year. And so if you were holding out to buy a new iPhone to get the, the latest AI features, um, you'll get some text editing capabilities. You'll get um, some features that summarize your notifications for you. But maybe the most useful in my perspective is semantic search in photos. You're going to be able to just search with, within all of your photos, use the natural language for any single detail. And it seems Apple is really well positioned to provide a utility like that. But a, a lot of the other AI features like Google Lens, um, they rolled out their version of that, um, the, the text writing capabilities. Most people are already using a co-pilot um, or an assistant. And I think the majority of users were just really looking and hoping for a better Siri. And as of now, the Siri that you're going to get is still feeling the same. And you'll be disappointed that it's not at the level of like a chat GPT, um, which a lot of users have, have been coming to love. Well, I think there's two points there. One is, uh, you know, Apple, despite its marketing, despite its positioning, most of their users are people like me and my parents. You know, I'm 54. My parents are in their 70s and 80s. Um, this is, <laughs> you know, this is what they want to do. They want to filter through pictures of their grandchildren. They want to find, you know, the ideal picture to share on social media. I think that is their audience. So they're releasing features that are relevant to their audience. I think that's fine. The other thing is, this is kind of something like a, a Tesla approach. You know, you buy the car, the hardware is pretty much the same. You're not going to upgrade the hardware and you just get these automatic updates that just make that hardware even more uh, likable and responsive. To, you know, responsive to the changing environment around us. So I think you're right. Uh, hardware has less of a differentiation right now. It will become an issue when we need more compute. But I think, as you said, like right now, you can actually get what you need from the hardware. And the software platform is the thing that you're going to have to you know, be interested in if you want to follow on, on these changes and these improvements. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm excited about, of course, you have the action button, I'm hoping that you'll just be able to match that to whatever assistant that you want. And so we'll be able to just bypass Siri for a while and use your preferred assistant. Um, but it's, it's going to be interesting to see how Apple evolves with their App Store and that platform that they created, uh, which drove so much business over the last decade for developers, for businesses, um, for enterprises, because no, Apple needs to compete with a lot of the third-party tools that were on their platform. You already saw that um, this this summer, you saw some apps getting Sherlocked, where they were starting to bring their own native first-party tools to replace some of them. And it's going to contrast Adobe's strategy to say, hey, bring your models, bring your um, third-party um, technologies and integrate here 
um, where Apple will increase and they um, say, we're going to offer our own text to image. We're going to offer our own um, text um, writing tools. And um, we'll see, of course, there is still going to be a place for third party tools and an app ecosystem. Uh, we'll just need to see where that falls, especially with a lot of regulation coming around the app store and the monopoly that Apple created with it. We'll see how they decide to navigate those waters. Yeah, very, very curious to see what happens. You uh, ready to talk about uh, the new models from OpenAI? No, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Because because once we start talking about um, OpenAI O1, that's going to be it. We're we're not we're not talking about anything after that. So there there are a couple of cool um, tools I'm going to highlight and some additional models that came out that I don't want us to lose sight of just because of the the breakthroughs with with O1. The first is going to be Google's Notebook LM. Notebook LM, Google released this really cool feature called audio overviews, where you're able to generate a podcast style conversation, just like we're having now, around whatever content you have in your notebook. Okay, so let's kind of set the stage here. Notebook LM announced last, last year by Google. It's a kitchen experimental tool, but I think this is probably one of the best AI tools that Google has put out. In fact, it's my favorite. You create a notebook, and you can put various sources of content in there. You can put slides, you can put documents, you can put URLs. And if you're a student, if you're a researcher, you can just collect everything in your notebook. And then the AI grounds itself in that information and you're able to have conversations with it. It can act as a studying assistant. It can generate quizzes. It's going to be brilliant for students, especially. I wish I had something like this when I was in college. Um, but this new AI, audio overview feature is just brilliant. If you're um, looking to switch it up, uh, to listen to your notes versus just reading them, you can have full on conversations. I took one of your articles this week and I just put that one URL in there and it was just brilliant listening to it. Um, you got a chance to hear it, Richard. What were your thoughts on it? And what do you think of Notebook LL? I, I actually, I love it. I've got so many things to say about this. The, the first reaction was, wow, uh, this audio, this interaction between these two podcast hosts sounded very much like a conversation between two people. They were interrupting each other and talking over each other in a way that a normal conversation happens. Uh, they were pausing. They were having these kind of very human anthropomorphic experiences during that conversation. Um, so that was lovely. As an auditory learner myself, so I'm dyslexic, I reading is a little bit more difficult for me it's a little bit uh, you know it takes a little bit more time having the audio i would much prefer to listen to a book on uh, on audible for example than to read it um, and so these are the kinds of tools that as you said if they were around when we were students would have been really interesting i then uh, introduced that tool notebook lm to uh, my son's girlfriend who lives with us and she's a student at babson um, she, she's studying currently studying finance and I gave her the tool and I said, you know, see how you could use this in your work this week. And she came back and said, wow, this was really, really helpful. I was able to design an output that was very relevant to my working style, or my studying style. So there we have it. We have, um, you know, a sample of one, or maybe a sample of two, um, where this is actually very practical. The, the, you know, that audio is not perfect. I think let's just uh, keep that in mind if somebody has listened to this. There is uh, a little bit of you know weirdness in there. You can obviously tell that it's not exactly human being, but it's much better than the audio readback software that used to help us, for instance, read PDFs and things like that, which had a very staccato robotic thing. And you know those are fine, but they're also very difficult to listen to. And I think for the human brain, uh, as storytellers, it, it, it often is confusing for us to give our attention to those kinds of, you know, robotic models. We much prefer the storytelling versions. So yeah, I'm overall very impressed by this. I would certainly be using it. Um, I'd love to actually see it integrated directly into something like Google Workplace where um, I can say, this is my preferred learning style, or this is my preferred output. Um, can you help me, you know, generate that on a regular basis so that, you know, and, and I, there is a, a story that I'd like to tell similar to this, which I've been using. Uh, GPT for work, and I'd like to explain that. So when we get time to do that, I'll do that. So I, I, I want to go back to what we started with about the technology versus the product. 
And here's something interesting because I think Google saw ChatGPT with OpenAI, the success they were having, and thought, oh, we need to mimic a chatbot. We need to create something like this because this is what people want. But I would argue that Notebook LM is a completely different user interface, a completely different user experience, but it is so distinguished. It is so focused in terms of the target audience. They would have probably been better served building a tool like that, just differentiated their offering from what everybody else was doing because it's brilliant. And of course you can do some of these things with all the chatbots, but the experience that they have built their own notebook LM, how personalized it feels. <laughs> I would argue that they have, um, I wouldn't say failed with um, competing with a chat GPT or a cloud, but I don't hear that many people that are excited about using Gemini chatbot as I hear them about notebook LM. And so uh, if, if you're a product developer, a designer at Google, I would say keep advocating and pushing for Notebook LM. You're onto something special and people are loving it. Absolutely. All right. So a couple of the tools that I, I wanted to highlight, a couple of the models actually, um, two, two or three interesting models that came out this week. The first is Hume. Uh, we spoke about Hume months ago when they released their, their first um, emotive AI, um, EVI um, one, and uh, this week they announced EVI two. And again, what Hume is really focused on is emotional AI models, uh, models that can detect emotions, but that have empathy in terms of how they communicate. And what I would say is just go and try it. It's, it's a model that um, feels different when you're interacting with it versus the personal assistance from like uh, opening with chat GPT or Anthropic. It's not just oh, let's be very factual or professional. Um, it's more of how can I connect with this person on an emotional level? And so I'm, I'm super excited to track the progress that Hume is making. I'm very excited about the new model. And of course, the APIs that they offer um, for developers, if you're building a product or a tool and you're thinking that your product needs an experience that connects with your users more, I would argue that this may be a tool that you want to explore versus some of the, the more traditional models. I think that's absolutely right, especially when it comes to uh, communications, marketing, any outbound stuff, uh, the more emotional content that you can embed into your storytelling or your messaging, the better. Uh, we just know, we've known that for, you know, many, many years since David Ogilvy started telling us how to write copywriting. Yes, we, we have. And then two, two final models that I'll mention, these are open weights, open models that you'll want to look into. The first is Pixtrel, is the first multimodal open model from Mistral. And they just literally in their style dropped the torrent link. Um, so you can go ahead and download the model. We're not sure what licensing um, terms apply to this, but it's based on their Neo model. Uh, but for the first time it's multimodal. So if you are a developer looking for a good high quality multimodal open weights model, Pixel 12B is going to be a model that you absolutely want to look into. And uh, the next model that I'm very intrigued about is Data Gemma from Google. And again, the Gemma family of models from Google rivals Llama from Meta. Um, they're open weights. You can use them in um, your various products. Um, commercial licenses are available, so you don't have to worry about um, anything like that. But with Data Gemma, they are focusing on building models that are not hallucinating as much because they're grounded in a massive um, database of statistically um, verified and validated data. And so if you know about like Google's data commons um, database, it contains 240 billion data points. Um, they collect it from the United Nations, from the CDC. And so these are um, going to be um, data points that if you are saying, okay, um, let's look at uh, the different state economies in the US and how they have grown since um, COVID-19. This is the sort of data set that you can go and you can find all of this factual information from. And the fact that you know how a model that is grounded in this data. So when you ask it questions, if it detects that it's more of a factual response that it needs to generate to that, it has been trained to go out and check that data, fetch it from the database and then um, insert it. And they introduced two new technologies. One is called um, RADA, which is what we are familiar with, retrieval augmented generation. And the next one is called RIG, which is retrieval 
interleaved generation. And so this is a little bit different from RAG. They compare both and they look at um, which one is more accurate in terms of um, just being truer to the data and which ones, um, in what cases they may hallucinate more. So again, a great week for open um, source AI models. If you're an independent developer, if you're a business and you're thinking, hey, we, we don't want to necessarily be dependent on some of the um, hosted API services, you now have Pixel, you have Data Gemma, and of course, um, new tools that you'll be able to explore. All right, Richard, one last thing that I'll say before we jump into OpenAI. This week, you started sharing a lot of op-ed pieces and um, strategic um, insights in terms of how companies are rolling out AI strategies and the challenges that they're facing, recommendations that businesses need to, to keep in mind. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to just highlight a couple of the articles that you shared this week. Talk to us a little bit about um, why you decided to start um, sharing these series and um, what users can expect moving forward. Well, just like you mentioned earlier, you know, very often the technology is not the story. The technology is just the beginning or the, the entry point into something large, larger. And the real story arc here is how does it get integrated into the day-to-day -day working of individuals? And that's something that you and I have been doing for a long time. So for the last you know, two decades, you and I have been working with both large and small companies on figuring out how to take their ideas or their businesses through a process of discovery and creation and ultimately build products. And so the building of products is not easy. It's a hard thing. It requires human beings. It requires a lot of alignment and integration and cross-functional work. And so the work that I have been doing and also you have been doing for the last two decades uh, has exposed that the technology is really never the problem. The technology has, um, you know, just like anything, just like a car or an airplane, it is a tool. And it's the use of that tool, the adoption of that tool that ultimately decides whether it's going to be something that has impact or not. So the articles that I've been writing are primarily focused on this idea of like, well, how do you get impact? There's a, um, an article about product leadership. How do you, as a product leader, consider how you might bring AI into your organization? What does that look like? What considerations might you have? How will it affect your team? How will your team see this as either a threat or an opportunity? Uh, lots of good questions in there and not necessarily questions that we've never had to ask before because of, obviously we're in another cycle of technology. We've seen multiple cycles before, but nevertheless, questions that are worth asking. And uh, we also make some recommendations as to how we might both include these questions in the day-to-day -day work, but also find answers, processes for doing that. The other types of articles that I'm going to be writing about are questions about whether these technologies are in fact the threat that we think they are you know where does that fear come from are we concerned mostly with the fact that we're going to get found out that we've been doing a lot of um, mundane bullshit work to use david graber's term um, are we are we hiding behind our meetings and our inboxes when we should actually be doing creative work what does that mean for people who've never been taught to do creative work how do we then pull that in uh, I'm also going to be writing a lot about the personal processes that you and I use in order to uh, take these technologies and apply them to the day-to-day -day product work that we do, both with our, with uh, with Imaginative and with our customers. Um, <clears throat> and that's very interesting for me. I want to just use that this opportunity to talk about something that I've been doing. Uh, with one particular company that I'm working with, it became clear that the product team needed to connect their thinking about what their vision was to what customers needed and ultimately what that would deliver. And this is not a, an unusual product conversation. Very often new startups are building a vision of the future. In other words, they've seen the existing technologies or we've seen the existing solutions that are out there. They're dissatisfied with that. They say, hey, we think we can do better. We've got a different paradigm or a different vision. They build that. They're building that vision from their own imaginations essentially obviously informed by their experiences, but you know it's vision led. They then get to a point where they have multiple customers. And in the case of this particular uh, company, they have now have, you know, uh, I think about 40 or 50 enterprise level customers that are using their product. And at some point their thinking needs to move from just being vision led to informed by customer feedback as well. And there's an, an interesting balance there. 
Um, we've heard a lot of conversations about founder-led. Uh, you know, that's the, kind of the, the the latest trend is to talk about what founder-led looks like. And so, with that in mind, I've been thinking about you know what does a company look like as it transforms itself from being entirely vision-led to being something that also considers what the customer is doing. Now, what has this got to do with AI? A lot. I've actually been using ChatGPT <clears throat> as a way to understand how all of these complex inputs can be used to help guide the decisions for a product organization. So uh, the things that you can't necessarily do uh, entirely without AI is you have to go and have a conversation with the customers, right? That's something you have to do. However, what I was able to do is I went out and spoke to um, a dozen customers enterprise customers, I was able to collect those conversations using both the tools that are built into the Zoom and, and Google Meet to capture those conversations, create summaries, create uh, um, transcripts immediately from those conversations. I then took all of those transcripts and organized them around uh, the themes that we were curious about. I then took uh, that document and combined it with the roadmap slash product mission, product vision that we have. And then I also combined that with the North Star metric uh, exercise that I had done with the team. And so taking all of these different documents and asking ChatGPT to find commonalities, you know, and what I'm seeking there specifically is, what do we imagine in our vision? What are we currently doing and that our customers are using? And what do our customers actually recommend we continue to build or improve or add. Um, and being able to see how uh, ChatGPT specifically and Claude think about these problems and think about how we might then organize those as product roadmaps, organize them as product matrices. Uh, also then start to think about how would we position these things in both internal and external conversations? What would the go-to-market strategy look like? How might we prioritize these things? Where is the highest priority versus the highest usage uh, compared against, say, high usage and low priority? You know, all of these different problems that product managers have to face, which is what do we need to build? Really, that's the question. Or where do we put our resources? Um, and, and the short story is that something that would have taken multiple months to do has taken me literally a couple of weeks to do. And I was able to create documentation to support the product team's needs. They're also, also doing similar work, but combining their work with the work that, that we've been doing, the customer facing stuff, that has really improved the process significantly. We've actually got down to documentation and direction that's really important. You know, and to use an Eisenhower quote, it's really less to do with the plan and much to do with the planning. But what but GBT is able to do here is accelerate that planning and give insights and, and even thoughtful reasoning, uh, depending on which model you're using, as to why that should be the case, why you should continue in this direction. Again, not necessarily using that rote uh, in the sense of like, I'm not just taking their uh, the, the output from ChatGPT and saying, okay, we're done, this is it, but really using it as another input and understanding that this is a place for conversation, for meaningful conversation to happen but really speeding up that process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna write up this process and write up the discovery process. It's actually very similar to what we, we've we used in the past, uh, but now with these tools, we can accelerate the work so much more. Uh, it's, it's kind of incredible. Um, and, <clears throat> and then actually train the models so that their memories exist. Now I can go back and say, hey, here's another example, or here's another scenario. Please use some of the understanding that you've already gained reference the formatting, reference the models, reference the research, for example, and it's all existing in there. So yeah, I'm very excited. I did also, um, this is going to be a kind of a slide into to, you know, our conversation about the latest models from OpenAI. I tried to use uh, the latest models, the reasoning models, um, to just see what the output would look like, if it was would be any different. Um, right now, it's uh, it's somewhat indistinguishable just because of the, kind of the nature of the work. This is not specifically asking it about quantum mechanics or, you know, hard philosophical questions or things like that. But I could see that 
ultimately, as those context windows get a little larger, you could start to add documentation, then you could start to improve that. But right now, as you know, um, they're somewhat limited, they're very focused. Um, and we can talk about that now. I think that's uh, become an easy, easy in for you. Easy, easy. Well, first of all, thank you, Richard. I'm so excited about the series. I, I the, the most recent article about um, the best way to learn AI by um, doing it by teaching. I think it's brilliant. If you're listening right now and you're thinking, I know AI is a big deal, but I don't know where to get started. I would say go to the website, um, find the series that Richard is um, sharing and just start reading those articles. They're so easy, so um, facilitating in terms of just um, giving you direct examples as to what to do, what not to do, um, mistakes and learning opportunities. You will enjoy it. And so I highly encourage you to, to start there, but I'm very excited about that series. All right. So you, you set me up for a home run and I'm going to take it. <laughs> This week, strawberry landed. Strawberry, you might be thinking, wait, what is strawberry? Well, strawberry was OpenAI's rumored amazing reasoning model. And OpenAI finally dropped it this week. We have been teasing it for months right now. And it is called OpenAI01. Now, let me let me tell it to you straight. This model is completely different from anything that you have seen previously. In fact, OpenAI says that it is such a breakthrough in terms of reasoning, in terms of its capabilities, that they reset their version counter to zero, right? So this is no oh, 01. This is the first model. This is only a preview of that model. And the reason that is important to stress is because when you look at the benchmarks and you see where this model is performing versus the actual model that they'll release maybe in a couple months time, that there's a massive jump in terms of capabilities and, 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 and reasoning that you're going to see. And so they're showing that this is not just a one-off, they know how to scale this. So let's talk about this model, let's talk about why it's so special and why you're going to be in for a lot of fun in the, in the coming months. Okay, so the O1 family of models are the first models that are natively reasoning models. When you ask a question to this AI, Unlike a GPT-4 or a Claude, it's going to have the ability to stop and to think about what you're asking it. And it, it sounds very simple, right? Like, what is the big deal about thinking? But nothing could be further from the truth. You see, before now, whenever you thought of AI models, these were all pre-trained models. Uh, OpenAI would go, they would work on training these models on massive infrastructure, expensive infrastructure, and uh, the point of GPT-2 to 3 to 4 was simply scaling the amount of data and the infrastructure that it was being trained on, and you'd get all of these newer capabilities. And that is what is often called the scaling laws. And so that happened at the training level. Once the model was trained, you had some optimization that could happen. So you could uh, make them smaller, you could make them a little bit more efficient, but there wasn't much that was happening after training. And so th that's why these were called generative pre-trained transformers, right? And so these are all pre-trained models. Now, scaling can be applied to inference. So whenever you now ask a model a question, if you have more infrastructure on the back end, if you apply more resources to allow this model to think, now you're able to get wildly, wildly more uh, accurate, more um, interesting answers than you were before. This model blows GPT-4, the state-of-the-art models, out of the water on all benchmarks. In fact, when it comes to certain categories, it's performing above a PhD level, meaning you're now starting to see hints of AGI um, at, at very specific topics or in, in certain domains. Um, and there's an entire video that I'm going to go on to dive deeper into this. But the one takeaway I wanted to recognize is one, these models can actually think. And here's a teaser. Right now, these models may think for 20 seconds or a couple of minutes, but one of the lead AI researchers said they hope to have models that can think for hours, days, even weeks. Think about it. If you have a model that can be working to solve um, the cure for cancer or some um, crazy formula, um, how much inference time, how much resources would you be willing to put into it thinking and iterating through different possibilities 
before it comes up with an answer for you. And so we're now in a completely new era of um, model technology. It's no longer just about, hey, we have trained these models um, with a certain amount of um, compute power. Now it's in real time, can you give these models that space to think and to reason. Now, I will say this, there are people that I've seen on social media say, no, the model is not thinking, the model isn't reasoning, it's just math. And I'll respond to you with um, an analogy. There's this anime that um, is called uh, Fate Stay Night um, Zero. And in it, there's this character who is a god, and he was one of the original gods, his name is Gilgamesh. And spoiler alert, if you um, are interested in watching this, you should pause here because I will be um, <laughs> saying things that will spoil the experience. Um, but there's another character that um, is essentially a copycat of him. He doesn't have all of these resources that the original God has. He's able to clone them. And there's this massive philosophical argument about the difference between a copy of something or something that is very close to the original, but it's not the original. And so the, the question I want you to ponder is, what is thinking? What is reasoning? And if a model is able to mimic or replicate our processes, it may not be the same way we do it, but if they come close to taking data and then going over that data, going through different algorithms to try to think of what their optimal answer is, how far is that from what we're doing um, organically? And at what point um, do they intersect? So what's your takeaway, Richard? I don't, I yeah, I mean, there's so many things there. First of all, uh, you know, I, there there are obviously some semantics here. We have to be clear about that. But the reality is, you are right. the The level of thinking that the average human does is far lower than what these models are doing. Many of us don't do thinking work. We do uh, mundane organization and administration work. We attend meetings. We empty our inbox. That's not thinking work. These models are actually not that far from actually being able to do basic thinking tasks. Um, there are a couple of things to, to think about. One is we're entering into, as you said, a new era, an era where the resources required to do this kind of thinking are high. So just to be clear, when you embark on using one of these models, you're using more compute, you're using more energy uh, because you're asking it to do more thinking. That, that tracks, I get that. One thing that we do run into, and this is something I want to write about, is we do run into the specialization problem. And the specialization problem is that uh, the same thing that happens, for example, when you go and do your PhD in molecular physiology around one particular thing is that you ultimately end up knowing more and more about something until eventually you know very little about anything except that one thing. And so you use the, the, the G in the general intelligence starts to escape you. Um, what makes human beings really interesting is their ability to do cross-functional work and to do generalized thinking. The, the generalist model as a human being, forget about LLMs for right now, has always been an interesting one because these are the people who make big breakthroughs, these are the people who lead companies, these are the people who can think cross-functionally. And then they employ the specialists to go after a you know, it's specific issues. So the T-shaped model is the generalist works horizontally or broadly, and the specialist works more narrowly. We have to acknowledge that the more specialized we become, we also create islands of knowledge and islands of speciality. What I'm really curious about is, and by the way, I should say, I like the idea that we're exploring models that can do better mathematical and better scientific work because we need that. These current models do not do that very well. We also then will expect to see that there might be um, some kind of transformer type model that allows us to combine the knowledge of these specialized models, these specialized modules or these models. And I'm, I'm interested to see, see how that evolves. I, we're not there yet. I think what we're going to see is more specialization it makes more sense. There'll be you know, a model for biology, a model for math, a model for, you know, physics, that makes a lot of sense. And then eventually, I think what we'll see is horizontal models that are able to dip into each of these specializations and act like an entrepreneur, act like somebody who can say, you know, 
hey, I understand how that technology works. I also understand how the business market works. I also understand how human beings work. And I'm going to come up with interesting solutions for that. So that's uh, my that's my sense. I'm going to write an article about that very soon. Um, but I do, you know, I have a, I'm a generalist and I have a, a particular uh, aversion to people, especially in the Western cultures, making out as if generalists are masters of none. That is actually not the quote. The quote that that comes from is um, master of none is better than somebody who is a master of one. That is the complete quote. Um, and that tends to be the thing that we are going to have to find a way through here is that our model builders, because they are specialists, they are going to seek out specialization models. If you're a mathematician, you want something to solve that problem. But we also have to remember we're human beings and general intelligence isn't something that benefits entirely from specialization. It is something that benefits from an understanding of those things across multiple different areas. I, 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 can, I can agree with that. So as I said, I'm going to be creating a completely dedicated video to this. I've been going through the documentation. I've been taking my time. And that's what differentiates imaginative content from a lot of what you'll see out there on the web. Uh, we're not just looking at the headlines. We're going through the research papers. There is, a, I think, a 48-page technical document. And I'm roughly around halfway through because I'm going through, I'm taking notes, I'm looking at their um, references and the appendices. And we're going to have a good quality um, video for you to watch to give you all the insights that you need from um, the O1 series. However, there are a couple of things I'm going to just tease you with that I, I think are worth just considering. With this new approach, they're using something called chain of thought, which allows the model to go through this reasoning um, exercise. And with that, OpenAI, for the first time, can actually get some insight as to how the model is thinking, right? Because it's, it's able to see the steps that, it, that it's going through. Now, there is an open area of research as to whether or not that is actually accurate because they have been able to observe situations where the model is deliberately deceiving the user because you see their reasoning. And even though they reasoned through one thing, they'll decide to output something else in order to either acquiesce to what the user wants or to meet their own goals, opposed to what the, the user is asking. Doesn't this like <clears throat> bring back memories of say, you know, primary school or elementary school when the teacher said, show you're working. And really you just kind of made a whole bunch of show you're working answers so that you, you know, you could satisfy the teacher's curiosity, not your, you know, the fact that you could easily, um, you know, go from say the problem to the solution. So I think we're we're actually anthropomorphizing uh, what we you know what we see in a lot of these models, which is models lie to us because they they don't want to hurt our feelings. They lie to us because they are aware that we are emotional animals and that we we do anthropomorphize everything. We do have context, and so these models are built by humans for humans. We should expect that they are going to also do human things. They're going to avoid conflict. They're going to you know, be nice to us where they could actually be direct and hurt our feelings. So I think this is kind of normal. I think this is a this is a good conversation to to have because we should expect that the models that humans build build will become human in the sense that they are also capable of all of the the, the nuances and errors that we are, you know, party to. Or Richard, I'll I'll be the first to say what if a lot of the things that we thought were uniquely human turn out to not be, right? And so, so one other interesting thing is they have these third party evaluators that have been also looking at the models and they have been able to detect the first signs within these models of some amount of um, theory of mind where they're able to um, use other models in an agentic way, understanding their own capabilities and of self-organizing. They're able to have some amount of um, self-awareness of um, who they are, and these are all third-party tools that are like Apollo Research that are um, doing some of these um, testing. So there's there's a lot to um, think through in terms of just the future arc of these new family of models in the O1 series. There are two that um, are out now. If you are a paying um, GPT subscriber, you can access the O1 Preview model and the O1 Mini model. And as you mentioned, with the O1 Mini, they were able to fine tune that with coding um, data. And so that is now 
super optimized for coding. And as you can imagine, as you mentioned, um, fine tuning that on biology data or chemistry data, you'll now have all these more specialized models for different domains. So overall, a fantastic week for um, breakthroughs in terms of technology. I have to give this week to OpenAI. They delivered, um, they didn't just announce a model and say, hey, uh, we're going to roll this out in the, the next six months, or we're going to roll this out to um, some limited beta users, like tools like Sora and or their um, multimodal audio and video features that we have heard about in the past. They announced it and it was available basically immediately. Um, so we've been playing with it. Uh, we're going to be sharing more, uh, but super excited about uh, everything that came out this week. Yeah, totally. Really, really good week for AI. Um, yeah, and and like you mentioned, we're going to be um, producing a lot more content that has a timeless element to it, that is talking about how we integrate this stuff into the work that we do, business uh you know, positioning, how do you make choices about how to use AI in your business, how your team might integrate it, uh, what those repercussions would look like. Um, and in fact, we, we talked about running workshops in this area as well. So uh, I, I was had a, a dinner with a bunch of people last night and they, um, different fields, real estate, finance, a whole bunch of people, and they all said, I would love to sit in on that kind of workshop because, you know, ultimately I think that my job is going to be affected by this, but I'm really not sure what to do. So if you are one of those people, you have a business or you have an interest in finding out what AI can do for you, reach out to us. That's what we do. Awesome. And this week, a couple of things to um, look forward to. I am going to be doing um, two workshops with entrepreneurs organization. So I'm excited about that. And so if you're an EO member, um, you'll get access to some exclusive conversations about strategic AI adoption. And um, we'll be looking at some of the hurdles that businesses typically run into once they're looking to adopt AI and things that we have seen in practice in the field that can help you to avoid or navigate some of those challenges. But looking forward to this week overall, but again, thank you for joining us. If you love the content that we're putting out, we'd appreciate a thumbs up or subscribe. Um, head on over to imaginative.com. There are so many other stories that we didn't get a chance to touch on that you'll love um, to just check out, to subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get a digest every week of those top stories and you can just quickly skim it and choose a story that you're interested in and jump over to read them. But with that, Richard, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, no, I will be traveling over the next couple of weeks, um, spending some time with some really, really interesting entrepreneurs and investors. Um, so more to come in terms of insights into, actually I'll be meeting with one of our friends, Nate Walkinshaw, who runs Taurus. They are essentially building a energy storage and power management solution that will be directly affecting uh, data centers and compute centers. Um, massive, massive opportunity, probably the, one of the biggest stories out there as we know, you know, what's powering AI. Um, so be spending time with Nate and um, some other investor friends of mine. And then I also, uh, talking to some direct companies as I uh, travel around the US. So I'll be I'll be traveling um, and coming back with some more stories. Awesome. Well, with that, um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Until next week, one love. One love. <laughs>